千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Eric Lin, where we delve deeply into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. As you saw last time, Chapter Forty One was a fairly long chapter with twenty-three lines. So what we did previously was that we divided it up into three smaller sections, based on the repeating characters, the poetic structure. And in our discussion, we had gotten as far as line 17. So there is just the one last section, section three, for us to complete today. And even though from line 17 to line 23 doesn't seem like that many lines, there's actually a wealth of discussion material to get into. So before we do that, I want to briefly recap the section two material that actually goes into section three. So in this particular chapter, we've been talking about high, higher level people, the mid level people, and then the lower level people, how the different levels react to the Tao. And then in the middle, starting from the middle of this chapter, we've been talking about the characteristics of the higher-level people. So altogether, there are twelve characteristics, twelve signs, twelve manifestations of the higher level. They are talked about from line nine. Down to line twenty, so they span section two and three. What we did was that we got to、uh, we got to the first nine of those characteristics. All twelve together, we're going to eventually want to summarize all twelve. And what we can do is that we can call them we can call them the twelve signs of the high level person. The high-level person is the Shang Shi. That's the first two characters from this chapter. The high-level individual is a high-level Tao cultivator, a sage, someone who is experienced and skillful with the Tao, and therefore a worthy aspiration for all of us. So the twelve signs of the high-level person, as I mentioned. We've already talked about nine of them, and we want to this time complete our discussion of the twelve by starting out with the last three. A quick review of the first nine will be as follows. We started out with the top three. And they talk about how the work of Tao cultivation is actually internal, and therefore it is not apparent. It is not externally directed, and therefore people who don't know much about the Tao may not even realize that you are doing this internal work. And number two, we talked about how as you advance in the Tao, you become humble. People who don't really understand how this works may mistake your humility, your quietness, your unwillingness to brag and show off as some kind of weakness, some kind of sign of being withdrawn. When that is actually not the case, you know a lot more than they do. But you don't feel the need to advertise that fact to the world. And lastly, 
with the picture that you see here, this is meant to depict that the DAO to the high level follower is something that is very easy to walk. It's paved, it's smooth. You can make steady progress on a path like this. It doesn't require any complex maneuvering. But to the lower levels, they would assume that the DAO must be difficult. And that is the reason why they look for alternatives. But then they end up spending a lot of time, wasting a lot of time looking for alternatives. So those were the first three characteristics that we talked about. They lead into four, five, and six, and these are more metaphoric. Number four is about the valley. The valley represents this open-minded nature of the high-level DAO cultivator that is also accommodating and nurturing of all diverse kinds of people out there, diverse kinds of opinions and perspectives. They're all included because the DAO is all-inclusive. We also talked about integrity, and this is where we I used a story to illustrate about the two brothers and the sage, that they were tested by the sage. One of them goes off to visit all the famous sites of ancient China to read and memorize the sutras, while the other one stays home to look after his family. And when the Tao sage came back, he realized that the younger brother who stayed home was the one with integrity, was the one who kept to his duties and responsibilities. And therefore, the younger brother was the one who was able to be accepted by the sage as a disciple. There's a little bit more that I want to say about that in just a moment. Number six, lifelong learning and cultivation. This is the case when the more you expand your learning, the more you realize there's so much more to do. So it's a never ending process, always more to discover. If one day you realize you think that you have reached the end of the road, that it's as far as you can get with Dell cultivation, that is actually a pretty good sign that you are not at the higher level yet. At the lower level, your perspective is characterized by limits. At the higher level, your perspective is characterized by infinity. No limits, no boundaries. Now, back to integrity for just a moment. This is a story that I shared with you before. So what I, the point that I wanted to make, the first point was that the older brother who traveled and who traveled widely and who memorized the sutras, he to all appearances seemed like he was ready to study with the real master, the Tao Sage. But the Tao Sage knew that this was only an appearance and not the essence. In the Tao, it's not the way you appear, but the way you conduct yourself. Therefore, it's never in accordance with the Tao to drop your obligations to go off someplace, you know, deep in the mountains, become a hermit and cultivate the Tao. That's not the Tao. The Mandarin text that you see here, Shen Fan Jian Shou, this is about cultivating the sacred and the secular, and one feeds into the other. What you learn from the Tao Te Ching, you can apply to life. What you learn from life can illustrate and illuminate your understanding of the Tao Te Ching. So they complement one another wonderfully. Now, here's the other point that I wanted to make. I know that in the past, whenever I talk about family obligations, I will always encounter questions like, 
well, I'm just by myself, I don't have any family. Or I would also sometimes have people who confide in me and say, Derek, I actually come from a pretty bad situation at home. My family, there was uh, you know, abuse going on. I had to work pretty hard to leave that situation. So I, you know, I'm not sure how this applies. So for that, for those perspectives, uh, questions in that vein, I want to emphasize that in a Tao story, we need to be careful to absorb the essence rather than the specifics. When the younger brother devotes himself to his family, that is the construction in this particular story to illustrate the importance of fulfilling your duties. Duties, responsibilities, um, obligations can take many different forms for different people depending on where you are in life. It may not be obligation to family that is first and foremost in your life. It may be obligation to something else, perhaps a group, perhaps a business you've started, perhaps a cause you're working on. So the important thing is to focus on the concept of being true to your honor rather than the specific way that that is expressed. The other aspect is that family can take many forms. Family is not restricted to the people, uh, the surroundings, the situation that we were born into. Any number of people out there have discovered that they create their own families based on the friends that they come into contact with. Sometimes you encounter someone, you become close to them. They feel closer to you than family. At some point, you may be able to build a core of friends, friendship that is so deep that you and your friends become more like a family. So the definition of family can vary. The important thing is to realize that you have certain responsibilities and obligations to that family, whether it's the biological family or the family that you create in your own life. So the Tao is never literal, sticking to the exact words of a story, but it's about concepts that we lift, that we liberate from the structure of the story, the specifics of the story, to derive the overall principles to guide our lives and apply them in different ways. So, Think about this group, a whole bunch of strangers that you have never met, being together online every Sunday to talk about some pretty deep stuff that are close to the heart. So in a sense, we are family too. We together are family in the Tao in a very real sense. So. What would be your obligations to this family? It's more like obligations to yourself. Are you able to live up to your ideals for yourself, your aspirations for yourself? Those are your duties. Those are your obligations. Are you true to them? That is the question. Next. Let's talk about seven, eight, and nine. That's the point where we ended previously. Seven talks about the activities that occur as you work on yourself. High level people are working to improve themselves all the time. But this is internal. This is something they do for themselves, not for other people. So. Other people may assume that they're not doing much because they cannot look within past the surface to see all the internal activities are happening. Number eight, constantly in constant, 
this talks about how when you are at a high level, you have definite goals, you have a vision about your life, you have perhaps a sense of mission in this lifetime. There are, there are certain things you want to accomplish. If so, that is great. That overall goal should be constant throughout your life. It, if it is a true mission in your life, then that mission will not change. What can change, though, is your approach to it. If one particular path presents obstacles, think of your flow as being like water. You can find a different path. You can get around the obstacle. You are never stuck. That's the basic concept. Never being stuck. You can always find a way, no matter what it is you are trying to accomplish. So when you are finding a different path to the same end goal as before, people who don't know what your end game really is may assume that you're constantly shifting and changing your mind about which way you want to go. They, they don't know. They don't understand. And it's okay. They may assume that you are not being consistent when, in fact, you have the greatest consistency in aiming for the same goal throughout your entire life. Lastly, and this is where the graphic for the ancient Chinese coins come in handy. This is the part where we talk about how high level people are exacting on themselves like a square, but they are round surfaces to other people, meaning they are using a soft touch when interacting with others. So the ancient Chinese coin is a good example because it's round on the outside, square is on the inside. So if you guys recall, I provided this particular saying, Nei fang wai yuan, and I explained that Nei fang means internally squarish, meaning internally exact, precise, disciplined, governed by rules. This is you interacting with yourself. This is you managing and watching yourself. Wai yuan, the second part, external circle, literally, meaning that you are well-rounded when interacting with other people, that you are using diplomacy and tact, and that you are gentle and soft and compassionate when it comes to other people. You cut them some slack, is what this is saying. You're easy on them, but not so easy on yourself. So the only thing that I want to add this time is that as is the case with many Mandarin expressions, sometimes the sequence can change. So the original way that I talked about it was internally square or precise, externally circular or soft or gentle. But you can also switch them around and talk about the external first, followed by the internal. Therefore, a valid way to say the same expression instead of nei fang wai yuan will be to switch them around and say wai yuan nei fang. In this case, same difference, and there are people who use one or the other, and they're recognized as the same expression. So this is where we ended up. And we want to now complete our discussion to get all 12. So before we leave this slide, let me just remind everyone that you can utilize the visual of the ancient Chinese coins as a way to remind yourself to be circular on the outside, squarish on the inside. If you take a look at my book, The Tao of Success, you'll see the ancient Chinese coins on the cover. It was there for the same reason. 
Although I think, you know, when I put coins on the cover, people will all assume automatically that the book, The Tao of Success, is talking about making money about material success. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. It's actually about overall success in life, which includes the spiritual components as well as the material components. So now let's, let's resume to talk about, let's bring our attention back to chapter 41 and go line by line. And in some cases, as with the next line, we'll talk about individual characters. So what we left was line 17, the great square has no corners. Now you know exactly what that means. Let's talk about line 18. The great vessel is late in completion. We start with the second character here. The first character simply means large, big, or great, da. The second character, qi. Let's look into that. So first of all, you might have just heard me say qi. So you may think, oh, wait a minute. I heard that before because, you know, I practice tai qi. So isn't that the qi that we're talking about? Um, no. And you might also say, well, I also know qi gong. Isn't that the qi we're talking about? Uh, no. The qi in tai qi is actually ji. It's a completely different character. Tai ji literally means the ultimate extent. So tai ji, tai qi, that's not the same character as qi in qi gong. Qi in qi gong means breath breathing or energy. So that qi is not the same as this one, although the sound is exactly the same. In terms of pitch, in pronunciation, exactly the same. The pinyin romanization is qi, the q is always ch. So that's qi. And careful here, it's not key. Q, it doesn't sound like K, it sounds like CH. Same sound as Qi. And that, the last character that you see in this bullet, that is the character for breath or energy. So we're talking about something that sounds exactly the same, but you can tell it's a completely different character. So what does it mean? Now in translation, it's rendered as vessel, but qi, this character, can also be interpreted as tool, instrument, conduit, or container. And it can represent all of the above at the same time. The way to apply it is to think about the different levels of applying the Tao. Remember, when we talk about the Tao, it can be at different levels of existence, from the personal level to the universal level, and everything in between. So let's stick to the meaning here. When we say Da Qi, the Great Vessel, what is that? The Great Vessel, in this case, means a great person a great achiever, a high-level individual who has attained greatness. So let me talk about an expression that is very common in Mandarin. This is used all the time. It's lifted directly from 41. So line 18 says, Da Qi Wan Chen. This is a Comma Mandarin expression. Here's what it means. Just as it takes a long time to create a large container, which in ancient times might be a clay pot, in later uh, dynasties, a large container might be a ceramic container. So just as it takes a long time to create something large, 
uh, that can work well as a large container, a great person, great talent, great skills, great expertise would also take a long time to develop and mature. So that makes a lot of sense. Want to make something big? Got to take your time. Want to create something great? Got to take your time. Want to develop a great skill? Got to take your time. So as I said, this has become a very frequently heard Yu in modern Mandarin. Yu is a set expression, usually four characters in length, that is used liberally in spoken communication. So when you when you use da qi wan chen in communication, in conversation, it is very similar to what we say in English, when we talk about someone, we describe someone as a late bloomer, that you know initially they didn't seem, they were still young, they were still developing, they were still immature, but then later on, late bloomer, wow, they've, uh, as an adult, they've become great in some way. You could, for instance, apply it to someone at a high school reunion. As an example, you may remember someone who was very awkward as a teenager back in high school days, but then you see them again in the high school reunion. Wow, late bloomer. That person has become someone who's almost completely different or someone who's like a far more attractive version of their old selves you know, as a teenager. The transition from teenager to adulthood for them has been extremely beneficial that you had no idea when you were in high school that they would become like this, so attractive or successful. And then you would describe them as a late bloomer, which in this particular context is just that, well, you know, this greatness that they have this goodness they possess, it took quite some time to develop. And we also, a lot of times when we're not talking about a person, or we're talking about a situation, uh, maybe a system, maybe uh, a process, we can talk, we can say, we often say, well, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, and what we mean is that you want to build something great, something good, it's, it's going to take time. Just like Rome wasn't built in a day, it's going to take some time for you to perfect a process. So these are all similar expressions to the Mandarin expression. So let's talk, uh, well, first of all, so there are two levels on this that I want to present. And I think with the two levels to use as an example, you can easily see how you can apply to other different levels. So first, starting with the personal level, as I said, the late bloomer, greatness, maturing, coming late into the picture. In Tao cultivation at the personal level, this can also mean that when you are developing yourself, refining your spirituality to become a high-level person, you are aiming for greatness in terms of your spiritual refinement. I hope that makes sense. That greatness is going to take a while to develop. It's an incremental process. It's gradual. It's day by day by day. Therefore, it cannot be rushed. If you try to rush the process, you end up with a metaphorical broken pot that you try to get into it too quickly, it doesn't work. Now, when you go beyond the personal level, when you go, when you look at the universe or the world, the same expression can describe the world itself. As we look around in the world, we notice the incredible beauty of nature. We see the majestic mountains, the canyons, the incredible scenery, 
that nature presents to us. And we know, just by looking at them, that these spectacular sceneries in nature, formations, this beautiful, startling uh, view that we see, these are all things that required an incredibly long time to take shape. So for my own personal travels, I have one example. In this slide, I've got Dangqi Wansun as the title. At the bottom, I have the commentary, the Tao takes its time to create some of the most spectacular works in nature. And the image in between that I want to share with you for my personal travels is uh, what is called the Devil's Post Pile National Monument, which is near the, it's in Eastern California. It's near the Mammoth Mountain, and it's a formation that occurred likely approximately 100,000 years ago with lava flow, which cooled gradually but evenly causing the even columns to form over time. And what is uh, interesting about Devil's Post Pile National Monument is that sometime after the formation of these columns, Glacier came around and polished off the top of the pile. So the top of it is actually smooth and revealing hexagonal patterns that don't look like the work of nature at all. They look man-made and yet they are perfectly natural. So Devil's Post Pile, a good example of the Tao taking its time to create something spectacular out in nature. Let's continue on. So we've uh, just been talking about how the great vessel, which can be a great person, which can be a great scenery, uh, it, uh, it's late in completion, meaning that it takes a long time to complete. What's next? Line 19, the great music is imperceptible in sound, meaning that it cannot be heard, meaning that it's silent. So the music is there, and yet it is inaudible. So what does that mean? Well, when you apply it to the Tao, this is talking about how the Tao can affect an individual. And remember, we're talking about how, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, we're talking about how different levels of people react to the Tao. When high-level individuals hear of the Tao, they practice it diligently. Why? Well, it's because the greatest wisdom of the Tao is spoken in silent whispers that cannot be heard, but can shake you up like the low frequency vibrations of a powerful subwoofer. It can resonate. So that is the silence of the Tao, just like the void of the Tao seems to be emptiness, but it is actually not empty. It's emptiness that is full of things to be manifested in reality waiting for its chance. The void of the Tao is a void with infinite potentialities all waiting to appear. The silence of the Tao is full of wisdom that is waiting to resonate with you, to be understood and felt by you. When it comes to silence and its relationship with music, I find it fascinating that musician Sting has speculated about silence in music. And he did this when he, uh, when he made a speech, a commencement address, 
that he did to graduates. He talked about the role of silence in music. He speculated that number one, perhaps we can regard silence as the mystery at the heart of music. This may seem odd coming from a musician, but in reality, it's very next level. Because what Sting is saying is that don't just listen to the notes, listen to the pauses between notes, the pauses between verses. Perhaps the notes in music provide a frame for the silence. It's, if you think about a painting, the frame of the painting is not the painting. The frame for the painting provides this enclosure to draw your attention to the painting itself. So his speculation was that the notes in music provide a framing device for you to be drawn to the pause, to the silence. Then he further speculates, perhaps silence is the most perfect form of music of all. Interesting. So I want to leave you with those thoughts so that you can better appreciate the relationship between audible sound, sounds that we can hear all the time, including the sound of my voice, and the sound of silence, which by a nice coincidence is also the name of a song. The sound of silence, yes indeed. So let's continue on. Let's, let's talk about how to use this concept about sound and silence in Tao cultivation. So now we know that high-level individuals emulate the Tao. So when they see that the Tao communicates through whispers of silence, they take note of that and they seek to emulate that for themselves. Therefore, high-level individuals utilize quietness skillfully in a number of ways. Let's count them down. Number one, they practice speaking less to convey more. That is, less words to convey more meaning. This is because Tao cultivators have always noticed how people who are not skillful with the Tao use a lot of words but convey very little meaning. It's even possible to use a lot of words to convey no meaning at all, like gibberish. Whereas, Tao is the ultimate example of saying nothing but con conveying all possible meanings. So halfway between that and the typical world in which we live, we want to say less and convey more. And therefore, whatever you say has that much more impact because you are picking and choosing your words carefully. So that's number one. That's one particular cultivation of practice. Number two, high-level individuals will listen between the words spoken by others to get the true essence. Think about how this matches the speculations that was expressed by Sting. Sting said that, while it's not so much the notes in the music, but the pause, the space between them. So there is a high-level skill in Tao cultivation, xin zai, which means to listen with the heart and mind, not at the words that are used by others, which is the counterparts to the notes, but the gaps between the words to get at the true essence, to get beyond the surface barrier of the words 
to get at the real meaning, the real lessons of what the other person is trying to express. Xin Zai, listening with the heart and mind. Get at the truth. So that's number two. That's another way to utilize silence and quietness skillfully. Number three, this is the easy one that I think most people will readily understand and recall to mind, and that is when you meditate, you are using silence as a tool to quiet the mind. When you quiet your mind sufficiently, you will find that silence is a powerful conduit to connect you with the Tao, to connect so powerfully, so clearly, that there's no obstacle whatsoever, no static, no noise in that channel of communication between yourself and the Tao. When you get to that point in your meditation, then you make tremendous strides in your cultivation. That's number three. Lastly, let's talk about number four. So number four is about what we do in daily life. So what happens is that we want to use silent actions rather than to lecture other people Tell them what to do, how to be, how to behave. High-level individuals will set an example using actions instead of words. So deeds, not lectures. So let's um, cover one more. One more line. Line 20. The great image has no form. So I want to single out the first two characters as well. So we've uh, talked about how light 18 is a uh, popular common Mandarin expression that's used on a daily basis. Previously, last Sunday, we I talked about how da fang, the first two characters of line 17, it means something completely different in modern Mandarin. It can, it can be used to describe someone who is generous and that has nothing to do with the meaning, with the actual meaning in the Tao Te Ching. Here is another instance like that. Da Xiang. This is also frequently used in modern Mandarin, except when used in modern times, it's not about the great image. It's about something else. Da Xiang, when spoken in modern Mandarin, it means elephant. And that has nothing to do with the ancient context. It's not even related. There's a lot of times when, because of the evolution of language, because of changes over time, the ancient meaning has a tenuous connection with the modern meaning. Sometimes it is a related meaning that morphed, that changed over time, resulting in the conventional usage in modern times. Not in this case. In this case, it's completely unconnected. So in the Dao Te Ching, it is not about the elephant, not at all. Literally, these two characters mean great and image. That's it. Great, you can substitute that with grand, with big, vast, and that's about the flexibility that you have. So here the meaning of Da Xiang is highly specific. It's the image of the Great Tao. The Great Image is the image of the Great Tao. The image of the Great Tao means it is the human conception or understanding of the Tao that we hold in our thoughts. It is the human understanding of it, therefore it is not the Tao itself. Just like your memory of someone in your thoughts is not the person. It's your impression of that person, your memory, your recollection of that person. In the same way, Da Xiang, the great image, is the reflection, the representation, 
or the, the, the closest, the best approximation that we have about the Tao. That is what we hold in our thoughts. Let's delve into the discussion about the formless. So the great image has no form. So right off the bat, we can see that the great image of the Tao, the image of the great Tao has no form because it is purely conceptual. Now, this is where it becomes important when we talk about human consciousness as it is related to religious beliefs, uh, religious iconography, religious images, religious imagery. We know that the Tao is not a human-like deity. So the great image of the Tao, the image of the great Tao has no human likeness no face associated with it. As we look around in the great traditions of the world, we look around at all the, the great religious traditions out there, we see human likeness all over the place. And this is because in the beginning level of learning, this is the same no matter which tradition you belong to, what religious background, this is the same all over the world. This is common to all of humanity. In the beginning levels, humans need and gravitate to yoshin, that which has form, that which can be seen clearly and ideally something that is human-like. Why human-like? Well, because it is helpful to see, identify, and connect with someone, someone that you can relate to like a person. So as I said, this is all over the world. I'll just use a, a few examples that I think everyone will readily recognize. There's the Shiva, the destroyer of the Hindu beliefs. There is the Buddha from Buddhism, human likeness, without a doubt. Now, of course, Hinduism and Buddhism are Eastern. So how about Western traditions? Well, of course, we all recognize Jesus on the cross. A human likeness to relate to in the case of Jesus, it is relating to the passion of the Christ, i.e. the suffering, the crucifixion, all of that. So we're relating to that from a human level. We recognize the pain and suffering. And on the Eastern side, with the human likeness of the Buddha, it's a it's a way to get us to identify with the serenity, the calmness, the peace that we can have when we understand the teachings of the Buddha. So this is, as I said, the beginning level. Well, what is a level that is higher than that? Let me talk about the next level up. So at a certain point, as you advance in your learning and understanding, you let go of the need to see a human-like form. I mean, you understand it. You don't mind the human-like depictions, but you don't need it as much as you used to at the beginning of your journey. Therefore, what starts out being a human likeness can be abstracted out of the picture. You might have started out wanting something like Jesus on the cross, but as you advance, as you increase in your own wisdom and understanding, you realize that, well, just the symbol of the cross is sufficient. 
I don't actually need a human likeness. The symbol itself will remind me of everything that's associated with it, i.e. Jesus of Nazareth. Same with Eastern traditions like Buddhism. At a certain point, you may also realize that, well, I can attain peace and calmness and serenity without necessarily requiring the face to relate to. I don't need the facial depiction of calmness, of serenity, to have that state in myself. You may abstract the human likeness out of it. So now you only need a reminder of an abstract symbol and not the human face. Now, this process goes from human, human likeness to pure symbolic representation is a clue. When you have seen yourself or others go through the transition from wanting to relate to some kind of deity to wanting to relate more to some kind of a powerful symbol, then you can extrapolate from that and think about the next level up higher. So what is higher than even the abstract symbol? If you have a guess, please feel free to type it in as I continue this discussion. The next level up, when you go from the abstract symbolic level, would be that even the symbols themselves can become optional. You still appreciate it, you can still understand it, you can work with it. It's just that you don't need it as much. Your understanding has gone from symbolic to conceptual. Therefore, your need for the symbols can gradually fade away. There's nothing, there's no form it's just empty and yet it is not empty because it's full of ideas and concepts. They just don't need to be given some kind of form. You can still connect to it. You can still relate to it. It goes from mind to mind, stays within the mind. So now, now that we have established what it means, to have no form for the great image, we are ready to complete our 12 signs of the high-level individual. We previously have gone from number one all the way to number nine. We are now ready for numbers 10, 11, and 12. That's what we have covered up until now. So we're ready to complete our mini summary. Number 10, the great vessel. So remember, the great vessel can be the great cultivator, the great person who would attain greatness in terms of accomplishment or in terms of spiritual attainment. This is about letting go of impatience, understanding that it's going to take time, that it cannot be rushed, so you take the necessary time to work toward that a step at a time. And then number 11, the great music, which is silence. So this is letting go, not of impatience now, but of noise. Letting go of sounds, noise, to quiet down, to embrace silence, because as I said, silence is the powerful conduit to the Tao. And then number 12, great image, well, the greatest image of all has no form associated with them, so you are ready to let go of form because the true essence is in the mind. And that is last of the 12 signs of a high-level cultivator in being able to work skillfully with all 12. 
Now I think we are ready to get into the very last section of chapter 41. Line 21 that you see here is the beginning of the conclusion of this chapter. It says the Tao is hidden and nameless. It harkens back to the beginning of Tao Te Ching that talks about how the Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao, the name that can be named is not the eternal name. So we understand that the Tao is everywhere, but you cannot see it anywhere. So the Tao is invisible as if it is hidden, as if hidden. It is because the Tao is not obvious, it's not readily seen, that we need to study, we need to discuss. If it were that easy, if there are giant signs about the Tao everywhere, well, everybody would already know it. We would not need to get together every Sunday to talk about it. We would also not have the three levels that is talked about at the beginning of this chapter because everybody will resonate with it powerfully and be practicing it all the time. That's not the case. That's not the world we have. We have almost the opposite, where the Tao is not at all obvious, not at all intuitively appealing, and therefore it's only a small number of people. You and I represent a small fraction of the overall population. So we have to become sort of like spiritual pioneers. We have to delve into areas that most people never even think about. So as I said, some of the teachings in the Tao seem counterintuitive at first. It is, uh, it all seems very abstract. So we call it the Tao, right? But it's not really the Tao because it doesn't really have a name. Tao is just a convenient label that we put on it. People can call it something else if they want to. So overall, we're getting a consistent message from chapter 41. In previous lines, Lao Tzu talks about the Tao being invisible, i.e. hidden, soundless, that you know the great music has no sound, formless, the great image has no form. Now it is also nameless. Now let's talk about the next to last line, line 22. Yet it is only the Tao. So this is sort of a transitional line. It connects line 21 with line 23. So let's, uh, let's talk about this. Despite the fact that the Tao cannot be seen, cannot be heard, cannot be touched, despite the fact that the Tao isn't even its real name, since it has no name, despite all that, it is only the Tao. Now, when we talk about the Tao, of course, we're talking about a certain way about the universe, the path or the way. We're talking about the patterns the things in the world, patterns about the existence that are repeated, that are reflective, that can be observed and understood. It is only through the universal way manifested in all the patterns that we can see reflected everywhere that da da da. And so I want to uh, take a moment. I want to take a, a quick moment to just talk about one aspect that is important in this discussion, and that is, that's the following. It is only the Tao. Well, things tend to work out, work out very well when we move in accordance with the Tao or to the natural flow. Things tend to fall apart when we resort to human contrivance. When rather than to move in accordance with the Tao or the natural flow that we try to force a will on it. So it is only the Tao that's going to work, that's going to work out well. 
I want to use an example. Before we get to the last line, I want to invite everyone to take a moment to think about this. Think about how when we flow naturally, everything works out, but when we try to force it, everything falls apart. So here's an example to illustrate the idea. I want to I want to use the idea of emotional upset. We all experience that. Uh, we all encounter setbacks, you know, things that don't go all that well, things that are not exactly as we expect, things that don't go smoothly, uh, obstacles, situations, upsetting situations. I like to ask everyone to think of emotional upsets as ripples. Ripples on the surface of water. So when there are ripples, there is agitation. Your mind is agitated. You have no peace of mind. Naturally, when this happens, we all have a tendency to wish that we were back in more of a balanced state. Because to be agitated, it doesn't feel so good. We want to regain mental balance, peace of mind. Now, when this happens, I know that a lot of people will try to regain that balance the wrong way. By thinking about what's wrong over and over again. Examples of thoughts like that, you already know what I'm talking about. You've seen it, you've felt it. A lot of times we engage in it ourselves. So we ask ourselves questions like, why? Why would they do that? Why would they do that to me? Why would they say that about me? We would replay the scenario over and over again. We ask ourselves, am I in the wrong? Was I wrong about that? Am I the bad guy? Now, when you keep thinking about the emotional upset over and over again, it is very similar to trying to smooth the agitated water with your hand. Imagine running a hand over the ripple to try to smooth it out. The result is even more agitation, even more ripples. So your effort to calm yourself down by thinking about it over and over again, that is a type of human contrivance in that, in the sense that you are enforcing, you are for, attempting to force your will on a problem that you are experiencing in your mind. So it doesn't work. Ripples don't get smoothed out by you running your hand over it. Emotional upsets will not go away if you keep thinking about it, dwelling on it, not able to let it go. You have to do the opposite. You have to think about what's done is done. There's no need to keep going back to it. You have to think about how the important thing is to draw the lesson from it that you can and then move past it forward into the future. When you take the opposite approach, that's more in accordance with the natural flow. It is like following the Tao by giving the ripple time to calm down naturally, rather than to revisit the cause of the emotional upset in your mind that you let it go, you give it time, and you know that after a while, it's going to calm down. It's going to start to work for you. The upset will subside. Calmness will return.
And after a moment, when water is perfectly calm, it regains the ability to reflect upon the situation accurately. Just like calm water in this image is able to provide a very accurate reflection on the surrounding trees. So bottom line, when you follow the Tao, everything works out great when you follow the natural flow. When you try to monkey around with it, you just make things worse. So it is only the Tao that will work for us. And now we're ready for the last line. The last line in this chapter is about it is only the Tao that excels in giving and completing everything. So let's break it down, let's analyze it. So first of all, the Tao is the ultimate source. So we understand that it gives rise to everything, it provides for everything, and completes everything. And if you wish to use a different label for the Tao, that's okay. Some prefer to use the label God for the Tao. That's fine, whatever works. So then here is a supposition. What if the infinite power of the Tao is connected to its nature of being unseen, unheard, unnamed, and mostly unknown to the general public? We know those are essential characteristics of the Tao. So, therefore, in encountering the Tao, a high level individual would naturally want to walk the Tao, walk the path. In the process of walking the path, that person, the high level individual, will become more like the Tao more Tao-like. How would this be different from the low-level individual? In the beginning of this chapter, I presented comparison and contrast between the high-level, the mid-level, and the low-level, three different columns. So I want to do something similar, do something similar to that. I want to use the very last section that we're talking about today, I want to describe the Tao. I want to show how the high-level individual is emulating the Tao, and how the low-level individual would move in a completely different direction. So here is the very last section that is today's focus. You can see that we're talk we've talked about all of these lines. The Gui square has no corners. Well, that's the line associated with uh, the ancient Chinese coins. The great vessel is late in completion about, you know, the Rome wasn't built in a day, right? The late bloomer and then the great music, imperceptible in sound, all about silence. So first, I want to draw from these three lines, 17, 18, 19. And then after that, I also want to I also want to turn our attention to line 20, 21, and 23. Not 22, because 22, as you can see, is a transitional line connecting 21 with 23. So let's focus, first of all, on 17, 18, and 19. How would this be emulated by the high-level person? And how would the low-level person be contrary to it? Here's what it looks like. I'll use the yin and yang symbol here to represent the Tao. I'll use the image of the Buddha to represent a high level cultivator. And I'll use this uh, angry emoji to represent low level people. So the Tao in line 17 talks about how the great square, which is the internal precision and exactitude in the Tao, it's all about how the Tao follows the laws of nature. The laws of nature in turn follow the Tao 
So you can say that the DAO follows universal principles. You can also say the DAO is essentially the universal principles and the natural laws. There are different ways to talk about the same concept, but there is a great equal sign between the DAO and the universal principles. In emulating this fact, in emulating this aspect of the DAO, high level cultivators follow their own internal compass, their own personal principles, their own personal code of honor. And they don't compromise in doing that. It is important to them to adhere to what they have already decided is what they will be disciplined in following. Low-level people, on the other hand, lack the, the discipline. Rather than having personal principles that they adhere to all the time, low-level people go the opposite direction, which means they give themselves plenty of excuses. No matter what it is, no matter what they cannot, cannot do, how they fail, they have endless excuses. Then, in the same line, line 17, we also talked about how the Great Dao has no corners. This means, uh, as we have seen in previous chapters, that the movement of the Dao is great circles. There's circular movements throughout all aspects of reality. For the high-level cultivator, they are inspired by that to interact with other people with circular, smooth, rounded surface, and not pointy corners that can hurt other people. And that means they treat others with a soft and gentle touch. What about low-level people? Well, you already know what I'm going to say. They don't treat people with a soft and gentle touch. The low-level will be aggressive and demanding. That would not be in accordance with the Tao. So then what about this other aspect of it? That greatness requires time. So in the Tao, you've seen uh, one example picture from my personal travels about the, the great, incredible beauty of nature that took time to actually come into the shape for the high-level cultivator. It just means that they too need to take the time to build themselves up. They are reaching for greatness and they know it cannot be rushed. Low-level people are the opposite. And by the way, as you think about low-level people, low-level people are the ones who are often in a frantic rush. They are often in a mad dash. The mid-level people I have excluded from this particular slide because there's just not enough space for another column. And I think it's important for me to depict the high level and the low level. Then you can come, come up with an idea for the mid-level people between the two columns by using a mixture of the high level and the low level. So remember, the mid-level people, sometimes they hold on to the Tao and sometimes they don't. And therefore, sometimes they are the middle column, sometimes they are the right column. And as we talk about this, it is also important for you to identify yourself to see where you land and how often you land there. Example, do you always treat others consistently with a soft touch or are you sometimes aggressive and demanding and can you increase the times when you are using the gentle touch and decrease the times when you are being demanding that will point to the direction of a cultivational practice for you lastly let's talk about the great music that is unheard, totally silent. So high-level cultivators would not talk about what they have done. Rather, they would prefer to let their work speak for them. 
Now, don't get me wrong. If you ask a high-level cultivator, uh, what are you doing and what have you done? They will answer directly, openly. They don't avoid the question. But if you don't ask, they don't feel the need to tell you all about themselves. That will be like low-level people who must brag to everyone within Yersha. So then let's do the same thing for the last three items that I pointed out, the great image, the Tao being hidden and nameless, the Tao excels in giving and completing everything. So same setup, same idea with the three columns, with the Tao on the left-hand side, high-level cultivators in the middle, low-level to the right. So line 20, the great image is formless. So the Tao is formless and shapeless. In emulating that, high-level cultivators will aspire to flow with the ultimate flexibility, just like water. If you can't flow to, to the right, you flow to the left. If you can't flow above, you flow below or all around. Low-level people, these are the ones that you can identify as being often very rigid and inflexible, very dogmatic. And then line 21, hidden, unseen. The Tao is hit, the Tao is unseen, the Tao is invisible as if it is hidden. Taking a cue from that, high-level cultivators feel no particular need to be seen. If they are seen, it's okay. But they don't intentionally try to make themselves seen. They don't try to shine a spotlight on themselves. Low-level people absolutely, positively, definitely must be seen by everyone. Because low-level people are all about the ego. Line 21, the Tao has no real name. The Tao isn't even the true name, it's just a label. Taking a cue from that, high-level cultivators feel no need to seek name recognition. If they attain name re recognition, that's just fine, but they're not out for that. It's not, it doesn't drive them. It's not their purpose. Whereas low-level people are obsessed with celebrity, with image, with perception, with external validation. They don't know that they're great. They need to be told things they want to hear. And then lastly, line 23, the Tao excels in giving and completing, the Tao being the source of everything. Taking a cue from that, high-level cultivators give to everyone. And because the Tao excels in completing everything, high-level people will always finish what they start. Compare that to low-level people, they don't look after others, they give only to themselves and they leave a mess for others to clean up. So this is the different, different ways to follow the Tao or not follow the Tao. And you can see a definite difference between high-level cultivators and the low-level people who react with laughter and ridicule upon hearing about the Tao. So we have only two things left, two things left to do in chapter 41 of the Tao Te Ching. We have to do the paraphrase, and then we have to do the full circle. Time flies when we're having fun, so we actually won't be able to get to those today. We'll do those as the beginning of our next meeting. For now, I want to get everyone to the summary. The summary is particularly important because what I want to do, especially with the summary, 
is to summarize all 12 signs of the high-level Tao cultivator, high-level people, the Shang Shi. I want to represent those initial slides that you saw at the beginning of our meeting, and then I want to get all 12 together in one slide. So it becomes a true summary. So the key concept from chapter 41 of the Tao Te Ching is Shang Shi, the high-level person. And the 12 points that you have seen, there is the clear unclear because the work of Tao cultivation is not clear to others, it's clear to you. There's the advanced retreat, and that's because humility is mi mistaken for someone withdrawing or retreating. They're smooth and uneven, and that's because the Tao is a smooth path that is mistakenly assumed to be uneven by low-level people. Then we have the valley, which is accommodating, welcoming to all. We have integrity, which means fulfilling your obligations, your sense of honor, your sense of duty. And then number six, the lifelong learning and cultivation, it's all about commitment, committing to the Tao long-term. Then we have seven, eight, and nine, and those are active, inactive, in that you're always working on improving yourself, a lot of activities going on, constant, inconstant, in that you are always aiming for a particular life goal, but you vary your approach to it, and therefore you are seen as being inconstant or inconsistent. Number nine, the hard soft, that's treating yourself with exactitude and discipline while treating other people by giving them plenty of slack. So that's number nine. And now, what we talked about today, number 10, number 11, number 12. To summarize them, number 10 is the great vessel taking time, requiring time for completion, which means have patience. And number 11, great music, letting go of noise, quieting down, embracing silence. This can be this can be applied in meditation. It can also be applied in communication with other people, whether speaking, you know, fewer words, more meaning, or listening. Listen for the essence, listen for the meaning, and not the words. Number 12, great image. Letting go of form. This was the last thing that we talked about today in the list of 12. So remember, the true essence is in the mind. Therefore, even abstracted symbols can be optional. They are not always needed. Finally, let's bring all 12 together. So this is the final summary that summarizes everything rather than to break them up into multiple slides. Previously, we broke them up into four slides. Now we bring them all together. Everything's present. As you can see, there's the passage from the Tao Te Ching that tells you what that is, the clear on clear, and then the key is internal work, internal work of Tao cultivation. At Vince Retreat, the key is humble, being more humble or having more humility. The smooth uneven, the key is smooth and steady progress. The Tao is actually very simple in essence. The valley, openness, accommodation, integrity, being true to yourself, your words, your responsibilities. Lifelong learning, making a commitment long-term. Active inactive, improve yourself. And you do this for yourself, not doing it for anyone else. If people, pe if people never find out about it, about the work that you are doing to improve yourself, that's just fine. And then constant and constant, having flexibility to get to your goal. 
in this lifetime. And then the ancient Chinese coins to have discipline on yourself, not other people. And finally, the three, letting go of impatience, take your time. Letting go of noise, quiet your mind. Letting go of form, focus on the true essence. So that summarizes the 12 things that we need to talk about associated with Sang Shi. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.